again, I'll be kicking things off and talking about our State of the James report, what that is, um, why we produced that report, and um, what you can expect to see when it comes out um, later this month. Um, and I'm also going to be helped out tonight by Warren Taylor, the Natural Resource Manager with the Pamunkey Indian Tribe and Reservation. Um, Warren is going to take some time this evening to talk a bit about um, his experiences with American Shad um, and the, the relationship that the Pamunkey tribe has with this important species. And then we've also got Dr. Charles Gowan, um, a professor of environmental studies and biology at Randolph-Macon College. Um, we had the pleasure of working with Chaz um, a year ago with one of his classes to study American Shad. Spent a whole semester looking at Shad and some of the issues um, specifically on the James that are impacting shad populations. And so we've got a great program um, and some really great experts this evening to talk about these issues. So to get right into things, I'm going to start us off by reminding folks what the State of the James Report is. This is um, similar to a report card you may have seen from, um, say, the University of Maryland. They do an annual uh, report card that talks about the health of the bay. Um, Bay Foundation does their State of the James, I'm sorry, State of the Bay report. Um, this is a report that the James River Association releases every two years, it includes 18 different indicators that help us to understand how the river is doing in overall health. And we look at a number of different indicators, um, including um, a category of river health indicators, as well as restoration and protection actions. And so that means um, Shad, striped bass, bald eagles, you know, oysters, examples of those fish and wildlife that are really a key part of a healthy James River ecosystem. That also includes habitat like underwater grasses and riparian forested buffers. Um, those are key types of habitat to protect water quality, protect river health, but also to serve as nursery grounds for species like crabs, um, uh, small young of year fish that may hide from predators in underwater grass beds. We want to have robust, healthy grass beds in order to support the overall ecosystem. But to really make a difference in river health, um, the James River Association is also very focused on meeting pollution reductions, um, specifically those pollution reductions that are stipulated in the Chesapeake Bay cleanup plan. This is an effort that we've been uh, working under for uh, quite some time and um, has actually resulted in really meaningful changes in terms of um, reduced pollution loads from our wastewater plants, from our cities and urban environments, but also from our farmland. And um, to make those pollution reductions, we wanna see things like cover crops. We wanna see riparian um, forested buffers planted where there currently are none, maybe fencing cows out of the river. There are numerous um, practices that we know help to improve water quality. And we've been incrementally um, as a state, implementing those practices for many years. Um, and so that, that's a good thing. And the results are really showing. In the last um, several reports that the James River Association has released, we've shown a marked increase in overall river health. So decades of effort have really helped the river rebound. And again, most notably in 2010, we kicked off this effort called the Chesapeake Bay Cleanup Plan which set pollution limits for all of those sectors, wastewater, um, farmland, and our urban and stormwater environments. Um, we are working towards making uh, nutrient reductions, sediment reductions in those sectors. And because those are the main pollution drivers affecting algal blooms, uh, poor water clarity, poor dissolved oxygen, poor water quality, um, those are the things that we've really been focused on in recent years in Virginia, and as well as the other Chesapeake Bay states. Um, 1972, um, the Clean Water Act was passed, and that was a remarkable um, piece of legislation that has triggered a lot of these efforts. Um, we've seen um, rivers across the country go from um, sometimes open sewers, um, polluted waterways, to um, remarkably cleaner bodies of water that are supporting tourism, recreation, uh, fisheries. Um, they're economic drivers, but they're also really key sources of recreation. And, um, and that's especially true in the James. Um, we've got the James River Park system um, in, in the capital city of Richmond. And we have um, just so many visitors that come to enjoy the cool waters of the James. So we've seen remarkable increases in overall river health. You'll probably notice that we are at a 60%. That's not um, as high as we could be. Um, we, we're always trying to, do, to, trying to get that score up to that A average. 
And, um, and we're going to be releasing our, our latest State of the James, our 2021 State of the James, at the end of this month to talk about how we've made progress in these different areas and where we need more um, improvement. So that is, in a nutshell, how the State of the James works. We, we use this report for all kinds of purposes, though, for um, educating um, our members and a, a general audience. But we also share this information with students and even with legislators. So it, there are really good, succinct points that we include in the State of the James which are really important for folks who are making uh, budget decisions at the General Assembly, but also for, for teachers who are studying the, the, you know, the cause and effect between nutrients and algal blooms and, and dissolved oxygen and teaching their students about those concepts. So it is a very um, central report to what we do at, say, at uh, James River Association. Um, but this evening, we are going to be talking about shad, right? Um, the founding fish. Um, the Elosa sapidissima, the most delicious um, uh, um, uh, um, is, is what that Latin sort of translates to. You've got, um, this is the largest um, shad species that we see um, you know, native moving up into the James River watershed. And um, it's a really important species for a lot of reasons. Um, shad have been through a lot of challenges over a very long period of time. We've seen ups and downs in the population. Um, this is a complex problem. And we've learned um, in recent years, but also in the past, that restoring shad is not really a one issue thing. It's something that's going to require dedicated efforts in a number of different policy and management areas. Um, we're not going to get shad back by simply focusing on one thing. But um, there's been a lot of really incredible work done to date to, to make, to make a, a difference for shad. And it's important to stop and kind of reflect on that before we get into the main body of our, our presentation. Um, the James River Association worked with the, the Department of Wildlife Resources and, and the city of Richmond and a, and a number of other partners um, years ago to put in a fishway at Boaster's Dam. So this was a big deal. Um, this actually reconnected um, American shad to some of that historic spawning habitat that, that lies west of Richmond. Um, and it's really great habitat in the middle James where they historically would have been present. So um, this allowed shad to um, break through that first barrier um, just, just west of Richmond and to, um, and to access that habitat. There's also been really incredible efforts done um, throughout the city of Richmond and, and really throughout the state to open up fish passage, understanding um, that dams are a big barrier to um, shad and other species reaching spawning habitat. Um, that photo there in the bottom right is of um, Harvell Dam from a few years ago in Petersburg. And removing that dam um, reconnected um, a large amount of uh, spawning habitat just um, upstream of Petersburg. So those are really important efforts. And the state of Virginia, as well as others around the Bay Watershed, have dedicated a lot of effort to improving fish passage. Um, and I see we've got some partners from DWR with us this evening, too, um, listening in. But um, in addition to the, the dam removals, the state has put a lot of money and a lot of effort into stalking shad. So this just shows you a summary of all of the fish that have um, uh, been grown out at hatcheries and released into the James River, as well as the other basins in Virginia over many years. Um, you know, the key takeaway point here is um, there was a large amount of effort put into to restoring the shad population but ultimately we, it didn't really work as, as desired. So we removed some of those dams. We, we improved um, fish passage for the shad. Um, we released a lot of young shad fry into the James, but at the end of that process, we were not seeing the, the desired outcome. We weren't seeing, seeing the shad population rebound on the James. Um, and in 2017, the state decide, decided to uh, pull the funding for that stocking project, kind of hit the reset button and consider where we go next. And that's where we still are today. We're really looking at um, what are the best ways that we can as a commonwealth really refocus our shad restoration efforts. And in particular on the James where we've seen such um, significant declines. So this is where we were in 2019 when we released our last State of the James report. Um, you can see there the high point in this data record um, is from 1984. This is data that's collected by the Virginia Institute of Marine Science every year to help monitor um, shad abundance. And they do similar work for um, each of the Chesapeake Bay um, uh, tributaries in Virginia. Um, the Department of Wildlife Resources also collects data up near Boshers Dam um, and, and other points around the watershed to, to monitor shad populations. And the findings um, that DWR has, has had recently are, are consistent with this. We've seen um, really low numbers of shad 
um, they are not, um, not rebounding the way we would like to see. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the theories as to why that is the case tonight um, as we hear from some of our experts. So, um, you know, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Warren to talk a little bit about um, his interest in shad and in particular what the Pamunkey Indian tribe is um, doing as it relates to shad. Well, thank you very much. Um, like I said, my name is Warren Taylor. I'm the natural resource manager for the Pamunkey Indian tribe. Uh, it's based in King William, Virginia, uh, right along the uh, Pamunkey River. Um, so Pamunkey people in general, I'll just give you a quick overview in history, but Pamunkey people in general have been fishing shad for thousands upon thousands of years. Um, very, very, very reliable food source for us, always has been um, until actually pretty recently. Um, we, for the past couple hundred years, we've been catching um, shad with gill nets um, during their spawning season when they come up rivers to spawn. And even prior to the fish hatchery opening, uh, our, yeah, fish hatchery opening in 1918, um, if they were to catch spawners and bucks together, um, they would actually squeeze out those spawns and uh, milk the bucks on the river at the spot yes. to just help, help return the population um and give back what we took that's pretty been a, been a pretty consistent um thing for Pamunkey when it comes to the fish hatchery is always giving back what we take from it uh, we truly do believe in that um and up until recently we've been doing our best to give give shad back to the river um so yeah um you can probably do the next slide uh as, just, as i said before the hatchery opened in 1918 it actually started off um, as a shanty, a much, much uh, smaller building, more like a fishing hut. It started off with an 800-gallon holding tank um, that was pumped full of water with a gas, uh, with a gas pump, gasoline-run pump. Um, and from there, it was all gravity-fed. We've actually stuck with that method of gravity of, of uh, gravity feed uh, water um, for 100 years now. Um, you can do the next slide. So. This all started actually uh, in 1918, actually a few years prior to that, because there was a noticeable decline in the shad population. Pamunkey people, like I said before, have always relied on shad for a food source, but during that time, we also relied on it for an economic source. So Pamunkey people were going all the way up to Manhattan and all the way down south to Savannah, Georgia, to sell shad that they caught in the Pamunkey. Uh, in, 19, in the 1980s, we actually started to receive funding from the Virginia Marine Resource Commission. Um, and that is actually when the fish hatchery that you see in these slides today um, was built and established. And so we've kind of gone on from there. A lot of modernization has happened. Uh, a lot of scientists from different organizations have come to, to help us out, um, keep up with a good shad population for a long time. Um, it did seem to be working. Um, next slide. And so, um, as you can see, uh, even though with funding happening, our hatchery did fall and actually disrepair, um, this is actually something that was fixed pretty recently as um, I think two years ago, uh, we put a lot of money into it to actually get rid of the windows, um, replace signage, uh, fix walls, foundation, floor, uh, put in new piping, um, stuff that hasn't been done, kind of a delayed maintenance type of thing. But this actually came a little bit too late um, for the shad um, population uh, to help them out because uh, and actually 2015 uh, was the first year in which no monkey fishermen had caught shad fish and honestly it was probably a thousand years um, which is a pretty substantial thing for us. Uh, we have whole community events based upon the shad run. Um, we call it, it's a community fish fry. Uh, hundreds of monkey people would come to this uh, from all over the country just to reunite for a short time and have a community function with everyone there. And that's something that's been going on since, well, really a fish hatchery at least has been established. Um, you can do the next slide. And so with when it happened in 2015, um, lack of fish being caught, the idea kind of popped up of uh, Pamunkey fishermen actually stopping the fish. 
uh, shad in particular. And that's mainly what a lot of Pamunkey fishermen did. The man, the man who you see here in this uh, photo, his name is John Henry. He's one of, I think he's about 93, and he still goes out there to go uh, net fishing for shad, rockfish, heron, just about anything you can imagine. Um, he's one of the best fishermen that we have. Um, so when he says that there's no shad in the river to be caught, there's reason for it. Um, and so John Henry is one of three Pamunkey fishermen left that um, fish for shad. So the primary reason for it is you can't fish if there is nothing to be caught. Um, and so with that, really, um, can do next slide kind of brings us around to, you know, a desire to go back to what we, what we once had, um, even, you know, 10 years ago would be better than what we have now. Um, our, our hatchery actually has been in operation for the past two years. Um, one, because of loss of funding, but also two, no fish to actually hatch. Um, gentlemen that you see here are actually Glenn Miles and Kevin Brown um, operating one of our uh, holding tanks for the shad. And so, shad fry. And so, um, there's a pretty great concern uh, and focus on what to do with the shad hatchery in general. Uh, we've always, it's, the building's actually been used for nothing but um, hatching shad and nothing else. And we're actually at a a time and place where we have to decide what it is that we're going to do with the shad hatchery. Um, are we going to convert it to a science center, a place for gathering, uh, for community gatherings? Um, are we going to continue the hatchery itself, uh, expand it to, you know, uh, hatch other fish such as rockfish, heron, um, sturgeon even? Actually, there's some conversation about that too. Um, personally, I'd like to see all those things happen and including returning to hatching the shad. Um, but we know that we actually can't do that. We know that the problem actually really isn't that they're just not coming back. It's more so that they're not making it back. Um, this is, you know, we believe it's due to primarily actually overfishing. That's what a lot of the fishermen say uh, back home is that the reason why they're not here is because they're being overfished in the bay and elsewhere. Um, it's been decided that if Pamunkey is going to continue the shad restoration process, then other things need to happen um, in First, and one of those things is protections for shad, protection for their habitat, um, and increasing the water quality in which that they're in which they're in. So these are all projects that, and undertakings that I, that I first have to take on as natural resource manager. Um, and so, and something I actually am quite looking forward to restoring the shad population, um, hopefully back to what it once was. Um, is there another slide? I can't, can't remember. That's the last one we've got for you, man. All right. That's perfectly fine. Well, thank you. I, um, I really appreciate you sharing that perspective, Warren. And I think what, what the tribe is, is considering right now and the kind of the decisions you're preparing to make on the hatchery are very relevant, um, state, really statewide and certainly relevant for what we're dealing with in the James. Um, like you said, yeah. there's a lot of issues that are hurting shad, and I think that's a conclusion that uh, um, that our state agencies have also kind of come to. We've really got to figure out what's what's out, what what those issues are out there that are hurting shad before we kind of revisit this idea of the hatchery. But um, it's such a key part and, of of the of what you you've done there. Yeah, the and there is one thing, one more thing I'd like to add too. Is this isn't a you know we can't just focus on one river, say the shad or the, the Pamunkey or York. And so on and so on different uh, rivers coming from Virginia it's it's all holistic they're all very much interconnected if uh, there's a healthy shad population in the James there's more likely going to be a healthy shad population in the Pamunkey and so forth and so forth um, so it's something that people in all rivers have to work together for um, if they want to achieve this goal that's right couldn't say any better than that well, I'm going to turn it over to Chaz now to talk talk a bit about his his work Great, thanks, Jamie. Uh, good evening, everybody. Yeah, I am going to talk about uh, the shad. Pardon me, <clears throat> Jamie. You're so there's who I am. There's my contact information. I'm going to put that uh, 
up there again at the end. But uh, go ahead, Jamie, if you advance it. So just in terms of their basic life cycle, their basic biology, uh, at least before the dams, they spawned a lot of habitat above Richmond. So I'm starting with the eggs up top and uh, you can see the timing and about the size of them. Uh, they Once they hatch, they almost immediately start uh, moving downstream, drifting downstream. So down April, May, they're about 10 millimeters. They're near Richmond at that point. They keep moving downstream. Early summer, they're down between Richmond and Surrey as fry. Continue to mature, move downstream between Surrey and the Bay by uh, June to, to March. So they overwinter in that lower river, about 100 millimeters as juveniles. Then they finally start to head out into the ocean. They'll spend one to two years in the ocean as <clears throat> sub-adults, ah, pardon me, <clears throat> non-reproductive um, uh, sub-adults, one to two years in the ocean. And then they start to make their way back uh, towards uh, the bay. At that point, they're reproductively mature, considered to be adults, and then they will start to move into the rivers and, uh, and begin their uh, spawning process. Individual female can lay more than half a million eggs. And of course, throughout that life cycle, they face a variety of threats. Jamie, please. And uh, you can just put them all up there, yep. So poor water quality in the rivers, loss of habitat, particularly seagrasses in the rivers, predation by particularly non-native species such as blue catfish, substantial water withdrawals on the river, harvest, uh, as, as uh, Warren already talked about a little bit, uh, although there is pretty much a harvest moratorium on there with the, with the exception of uh, things like tribal and research fisheries. Of course, they have to get upstream past the dams so a variety of, of threats. Uh, go ahead and advance one more. Uh, I can see on this slide where those threats affect them in their life cycle. So throughout their fresh water periods, they're subject to these water withdrawals, predation, habitat, water quality. Then again, advance please. And they get out into the ocean and there is no directed harvest on these fish, uh, but they are subject to bycatch in the ocean. So people fishing for other things are gonna, commercial fishing uh, catches them as, as bycatch. Uh, next one, please. Uh, there, they, they migrate up and down uh, the East Coast all the way up into Canada. Each of those different colors is a different jurisdiction in terms of management policy. So they face a complicated regulatory atmosphere when they're out in the ocean. Uh, next one, please. Uh, there is, as we've already heard, some a little bit of bay harvest. Um, and then they finally get back up into the river. One more click, please. And that's where the dams start to affect them. And as Jamie said, all of the dams on the James have now been breached, uh, not totally removed, but at least notches put into them. Bosher's Dam Fishway has been constructed. Um, but we think there's pretty good evidence that those dams remain uh, migratory obstacles for these things that, that they're not passing fish as if there were no river, uh, no dams in the river at all. Next, so there's the life cycle. Uh, so then what we did as part of our work with JRA is we turned that life cycle into a mathematical model. I'm not gonna go through this. The point is if you start in the upper left, uh, that's the number of spawners coming back in the river. And then we just, track their life cycle, eggs are produced, they start to move downstream. Uh, those numbers, uh, those letters and numbers in parentheses, those are different sources of mortality. The ones in black are natural mortality. So obviously these things die of natural causes. The ones in the red are anthropogenic factors such as water withdrawals and dams, et cetera. So what we, what we did in putting this together was we went into the literature and tried to find reliable, sometimes back of the envelope, uh, numbers for what survival rates were for these various sources. 
And what we were hoping to find was a smoking gun by running the model and plugging in different values for different survival rates at different points in the life cycle. We were hoping to be able to identify, ah, here's where the bottleneck is where too many of them are dying. Uh, go ahead, Jamie. Well, here is what we found out. Um, if you just run the model without any anthropogenic mortality, we get about 30% XX production in terms of adults. In other words, enough adults should come back to the river where you could kill 30% of them and you would still have plenty to, for a self-sustaining uh, population. But the anthropogenic sources in total seem to be 70 to 90%. One more click, I think I've got red circles. Oh, sorry, some of the animations aren't working. So that's 70 to 90%, obviously way above the 30% that they can sustain. Uh, there's the R, best estimates of what kind of mortality rates are being imposed by each of the anthropogenic factors. And you can, I told you we were looking for a smoking gun. What, what we found is they're really facing an artillery barrage. Uh, essentially any one of those anthropogenic factors is imposing enough mortality to prevent a self-sustaining uh, fishery out there. Uh, I want to talk about one of them in particular, water withdrawals. Jamie, if you could go one more. And it's not because we think this is the smoking gun. They're all smoking guns, but this one's particularly timely uh, because these two large uh, power plants on the river, conventional power plant at Chesterfield and the nuclear one down at Surrey, they're currently either starting or in the process of relicensing. And uh, that is a regulatory process where you can fix some of the, the problems. Uh, so what are the problems? Well, the first thing is that uh, these power plants individually take essentially all of the water out of the river, run it through the power plant as cooling water and then discharge it back into the river. So particularly at, at during low flow seasons, all of the water flowing down the James River is going through these power plants. They do have screens on the, on the plant, so an attempt to keep fish out. The trouble is those screens uh, were designed for 1960s standards. They don't meet our current standards. You get impingement and entrainment. So here's a picture of fish being impinged onto the screen. They'll die there. So that's impingement. Entrainment is when they just simply go through the mesh and into the power plant itself. So we worry about impingement and entrainment. Current policies from Division of Wildlife Resources is those screens should be built to have one millimeter mesh to prevent entrainment of very small life stages like fry and a very slow, what's called approach velocity, quarter of a foot per second. And that's slow enough so that if a fish does contact the screen, it's able to swim fast enough to uh, free itself from the screen surface. You can see what the design is out there currently. The, the mesh size is, is nine and a half times bigger. So there's gonna be some large fish that can go through that mesh. And the approach velocities are uh, in some cases more than four times higher than, than uh, what would be necessary for these fish to get themselves off the screen. So this is not proof that, uh, that these water withdrawals uh, how big of a contribution they're making to the problems that Chad have. Um, but again, because we're in this, starting this regulatory process, this is a place where some significant progress uh, could be made uh, to help protect these fish. Next slide, please. Uh, and just a reminder there, there, I'm not saying that the water withdrawals are the problem. There, there is a loss of seagrasses, the water withdrawals, the blue catfish, a little bit of bycatch out in the ocean. The date on the dam passage indicates that they're not getting past these dams very efficiently. And even the back of the envelope estimates we were not able to make about water quality and downstream dam passage, the adults have to get downstream and get back out to the ocean. So there's a lot of problems out there. So that's the bad news. Here's the good news. Uh, they really are worth the effort. Uh, if you haven't read John McAfee's book, it really is an excellent summary of the importance of these shad culturally, et cetera. The other good news is anything we do to help the shad is helping the James overall, get the seagrasses back, we get more crabs, et cetera, et cetera. 
it is definitely hope is not lost because the two rivers to the north, uh, they're not in fantastic shape, but they're in much better shape than the James and populations seem to be uh, either steady or increasing in those rivers. So it is definitely not hopeless. And the JRA has done a great job of taking these initial and the Department of Wildlife Resources and other agencies taking these small steps to at least get us going. It took decades for the problem to develop. It's gonna take probably decades to solve it. The last thing I just wanna leave you with, Jamie mentioned that we did all this uh, as a class project and we are always looking for new clients. We call them clients. There's my contact information. So what, do we, what can we do for you? Uh, we got 25 or so college students. They'll work for free all semester, spring or fall. For complicated projects, we'll do it for the full year. What are we looking for? We want a problem that is complicated. We're an interdisciplinary program, so we want an interdisciplinary problem. Uh, in order for this to really have some benefit, uh, we like to have a lot of background information available so that we can build upon it. We want to work with you to develop clear objectives, and we'll put those in the form of an RFP to the students. We want our students to get out and do field work, do a lot of data analysis, stats, GIS, et cetera. Uh, and we do ask you to buy into the fact that, that the primary purpose of this course is educational mission for future professionals. Uh, so it's great when the client really takes on helping us educate these students. And we are available to talk to you about upcoming projects whenever you want, ideally at least three months ahead of time. We plan the following year's projects starting in spring. So spring's a great time to contact us, but I would talk to anybody right now. If uh, It doesn't have to be shad, let me make that clear. We have worked on climate change and wetlands and uh, all kinds of problems. We don't care what the problem is. Uh, we just wanted to have these characteristics that are on the screen in, in front of you. We work for, um, uh, federal agencies, small nonprofits, uh, homeowners associations. We'll work with anybody who's, who's uh, got a project that works well for, for the class. All right, that's my sales pitch for the, uh, for the course, and that's all I've got. Thank you, Chaz. Um, Took me a second to get off mute there. Sorry, folks. Um, yeah, we really appreciate you, you being here this evening, but also um, the information that your students and, and yourself pulled together uh, was extremely helpful in, in really breaking down some of these issues. And also point out that some of the, the information um, Randolph Macon uh, pulled together was shared with another task force um, of uh, fisheries experts from across the state um, called the Alosa Task Force. Um, made up of agencies and academics. So this, this information has definitely um, kind of grown legs and ha has been useful for JRA, not only for this webinar, but it's something that we're, we're using going forward as we kind of make a pitch for some actions. So we, we've just covered a lot of information, folks, and I want to um, repeat some things that I think are particularly important. Um, I, I mentioned a lot of these issues at the very start of the presentation, um, Warren has, has mentioned a, a number of these in his remarks. And then, of course, Chaz um, just spent some time talking about all of these, too, in, in the life cycle model. And it, we really have to stress there isn't a, a, a silver bullet. Um, as Chaz said, these fish are facing a barrage of issues as they attempt to, to revisit their, their spawning grounds and complete their life cycle. And the reason that we are not seeing shad in the numbers that they, they should be in in the James is really the classic death by a thousand cuts. We've got a number of issues that are, that are hurting the species and a number of things that we really need to focus on. So some, some other good news that I wanna point out. Um, when we look at our State of the James report, where we see a lot of improvements and see a lot of um, progress is in pollution reductions and in implementing practices on the ground to reduce pollution loads. Uh, notably again, nutrients and sediment. And those are the kinds of things that are gonna benefit water quality. They're gonna allow us to, to have habitat and we'll start to see uh, more underwater grasses. Um, the James is doing better in terms of its overall acres of underwater grasses. In fact, 
Um, one thing that we've noticed in the latest Virginia Institute of Marine Science data um, is that we're seeing some small beds show up in the, in the upper section of the tidal James. where We typically do not see them. So that's sort of a, a nice bright spot um, that we're seeing this year is we are seeing small returns of underwater grasses. And those are incredibly important as nursery grounds for small fish, including shad. We know that as we have more of that, that um, habitat available, that's gonna be a good thing for shad. Um, water withdrawals, that is a incredibly important issue that's really specific to the James, I would say. If you look across the Commonwealth, um, the James does have a, a heavier industrial presence and does have some of these large plants that are using a lot of water. Um, and these are plants um, usually that were designed a long time ago, power plants, industries that have been in existence for a long time. Some of the technologies that they're using may predate what's available today and what would be required of an industry that was trying to build a plant today on the river. Um, the, the Chesterfield Power Station and the Surrey Nuclear Power Plant in particular are the ones that Chaz pointed out. Those are using um, an incredible volume of water. Um, Surrey is permitted for over 2 billion a day when it's in, in, in full-blown operation, when they're not going through a refueling cycle. So that is a lot of water that is being pulled through the plant. Um, Chesterfield Power Station is permitted for up to a billion gallons of water a day. Um, and there are, there are studies that have been done in the past that show a lot of fish get pulled into those screens um, just as a matter of operating the, the plant. Um, there, there are some things to keep in mind though, some good news on, on the water withdrawals. Um, the Chesterfield Power Station is gonna be retiring um, their coal units in a, about a year and a half. And that means they're gonna be drastically reducing the quantity of water that's being pulled through the plant. Um, as Chesterfield goes through a, um, a repermitting process, which is um, expected to kick off very soon, um, their, their water permit actually expires this month and we'll be on the lookout from the Department of Environmental Quality for an opportunity to comment on the next permit. Um, the, that facility is gonna also be required to make some improvements to their intakes, um, or in other words, to, to do the, the best they can to minimize impingement and entrainment. And that's um, coming along as a result of some federal rules related to cooling water intakes. So um, two, two good things. Um, we are seeing improvements to water quality. We are seeing improvements to habitat as a result of pollution reductions and our work on the landscape to, to really improve water quality. And we do have some things on the horizon that are gonna help us in terms of the water withdrawals and reducing the potential impact on um, shad, but also a lot of other species. Um, and that's something that's also true about all of these actions that I've kind of outlined here. If we work on all of these things, it's gonna be um, a, an important um, step forward, not just for American shad, but for a lot of other species and for water quality and for our enjoyment of the river. Um, some other things that we really need to be um, taking a closer look at probably as, as we've heard already, there's probably more to learn about dams and, and where there are opportunities to improve passage or remove dams entirely, if that is feasible. Um, we do have exotic species that have been introduced to the James. That's a picture of a, a channel catfish in um, Catfish Alley from the Richmond Times Dispatch. Um, those, those are um, predator um, species that will um, happily gobble up um, shatter or anything else that's moving up through the falls during the spawning season. And then again, there's that question, um, that black box of what percent of, of uh, shatter really being taken by the offshore bycatch. So they're not seeking shad, but they may um, incidentally be catching American shad when they're targeting other species. We really have to focus on all of these things to make a difference. So this is our, our, our big reveal for the night, folks. Um, and maybe it's no surprise given um, the sort of dire story we've, we've shared with you so far, but based on the 2021 data, which will be reported in our State of the James report, we are at 0% of the goal that was set by the Chesapeake Bay program to restore shad. And so this is the, the, the years of data that we have available from them. Um, this year we are uh, less than a, than a percentage point. And so we're calling that a zero. So um, last report, we were at a one. Um, this year we're at a zero. We can't really get much lower than this um, unless, we're, unless the scientists are not finding any shad at all um, when, they, when they look again next year. And so the key message tonight is that the founding fish is really on the brink of collapse in the James River, and that it's really a dire and urgent time to, to take some meaningful steps um, to help this species. Um, we're gonna work on water quality, we're gonna work on water intakes, and we're gonna, we're gonna continue to, to make progress on those issues, no matter what. We're gonna work on those anyway. 
But one of the things that the James River Association is working on, and we're, we're teaming up with um, a number of other um, folks in, in our state agencies to work through this process, is we're calling for a James River American Chad uh, recovery plan. This is a, a plan that really explores these issues in greater depth, um, uh, presents some, some real management options that we can uh, take to help protect species and to tackle some of these issues. And this is really a key step to, um, um, like I said in the beginning, um, we stopped the hatchery, we're going back to the drawing board. We really need a solid plan that's gonna, that's gonna pave the road forward on how we approach American shad restoration. We're not at, not at the point now of starting up a hatchery and, and trying to, to give it that shot in the arm of um, a hatchery um, release, but um, we know that if we can continue to make meaningful effort on all these issues and to reduce the, uh, the, the, the intense pressure that American shad are currently facing, we still have a chance to, to save this fish, but it's gonna take a little bit of dedicated effort um, from the Virginia Marine Resources Commission, um, from the Department of Wildlife Resources, from all the stakeholders, the tribes that care about shad, this is going to be a long-term effort to really um, uh, get shad back in those in those really um, um, historic numbers that we've we've seen through history. So, folks, I hope that inspires you to want to get involved and help out. Um, this is just the beginning of a long process. Um, we are at a very low point for American shad, but we are looking ahead. We are looking to the future, and um, you know we could. You know, we have two options in this in this situation. We can give up on this fish, or we can really talk about some meaningful steps we can take um, in a statewide effort, but also specifically in the James to help these fish. So there's lots of ways for you to get involved going forward. Keep an eye out for this State of the James report as we do release it um, later this month. Um, we hope that you will look at some of the programs that we offer as an organization. You can become a member. You can be a volunteer. We have... Um, all kinds of volunteer niches, uh, depending on what you, you like to do. If you wanna be on the water, um, monitor conditions, monitor water quality. Um, we have a lot of um, interesting projects um, to get you involved that way. But we also hope that you'll consider joining our action network, um, becoming a river rep, um, or in other words, um, volunteering to step up at the right time and let our legislators know, let our elected officials know that we need to invest in American shad restoration or that we need to um, uh, let them know that this is a priority issue that people care about. So if this is something that you really wanna um, get involved in that you care about, we hope you'll, you'll check out our website and, um, and, and follow us as we continue this important work. So that's our program folks. I'm gonna um, uh, pause for a moment there and uh, give you a chance to um, absorb all that information. And we're gonna start answering some questions if we've got some that are backed up in the chat box. And um, Aaron, if, if there are any that I haven't answered already that you would kind of raise to the top, we can jump right in. Nope, Jamie, I don't think we have any questions. Uh, just some thank yous to our presenters, uh, which is great. But if anybody has questions, feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to or chat them in the chat box. Hey, Jamie, this, this is, uh, I don't know if you can hear me. This is Alan. Yes, I can hear you, Alan. <laughs> hey, just, just one thing, I just, uh, just for the benefit of the, the whole group, um, one thing to point out, if you go back and look at the long-term landings for American shad uh, in the James River and the others, if you look at the period of time in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, there were declines then compared to say back at the turn of the century, you know, uh, 1900s, 1800s and 1900s. But if you look at that 20 or 30 year period, we had, you know, more, you know, we had just thousands and thousands more shad than we have now. And of course that's all prior to any fish passage work in the fall zone. So of course fish passage is very important. You know, we want, we want the full, extent of their spawning habitat to be accessible but it's just it's just something to think about if you go back and look at that you know is it basically you know we got to the 70s you know shad numbers just really really started to fall and then of course by the early 90s we had the the, re, the reason for the american shad harvest moratorium which is has stayed in place um so just wanted to point that out for the benefit of the group 
Thank, thank you, Alan. And also for everyone to be aware, Alan Weaver is the Fish Passage Coordinator for the Department of Wildlife Resources and has um, dedicated a substantial part of his career to, to restoring shad and fish passage. So, Alan, actually, while you're while we've got the mic, do you want to comment on the Rappahannock? We had a question about what's what's the situation on the Rappahannock. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, well, the, with the Rappahannock, what's what's different about the Rappahannock is number one, we removed Embry Dam, which was great, but we also don't have a way to directly monitor the number of American shad or the other species that go upriver. Um, I can tell you that with the Rappahannock, we do get uh, blueback herring, alewife, hickory shad, and American shad that all make it through the fall zone of the Rappahannock and all make it at least five miles upstream. And we have found American shad and blueback herring uh, 28 miles upstream uh, at Kelly's Ford, which is good news. But those are, you know, periodic sampling during the spring and presence data. We don't, we don't know how many are getting up there. Um, the sampling of American shad in the fall zone on the Rappahannock compared to the James, you know, some years I get more American shad in the Rappahannock and some years I get more American shad in the James. This year happened to be a really bad year for the Rappahannock up in Fredericksburg, you know, even compared to the, to the, um, the city of Richmond where we sample. So, you know, that kind of sampling, it has a lot of variability in it, boat electrofishing. But if you look at the VIMS data, they have had some good news with the Rappahannock where they've had increases in their catch index uh, about 40 miles downstream of Fredericksburg. Uh, so in terms of, I think, you know, numbers of American shad getting into the Rappahannock, I think that is doing well. It's not at target levels yet, uh, but it's certainly better than what we're seeing on the uh, on the uh, James River, the um, you know I also I also just point out that Jamie said it at the very beginning. Those trends you're looking at uh, of the the abundance index, it's the it's the same trend as what we see with the numbers of American shad passing through the Bossier's Fishway. Uh, you know, early 2000s we had a peak, then it got bad, and then around 2011 we had another peak of uh, numbers of American shad going through the fishway, which, which makes sense when you think about it. You have more American shad getting into the river, getting to Richmond, making it through the fall line and getting up to the Bossier's fishway, you're gonna, you're gonna have more passage. Um, I just, obviously we would just thought at this point in time, we'd be seeing more American shad making it back to the city of Richmond. Um, I'll, uh, but, oh. Sorry, this is this is Jazz Gown again. I, just looking at the questions in the in the chat, comparing what's going on in the James to North Carolina, and then also the rivers north of us, including the Potomac and the Rap. If so, this is part of what we did with the class. We did a comparison across those rivers. Uh, so, how much water is being taken out of them? How much seagrass, acres of seagrass, is in there? What are uh, what's predation like, what, what are populations of predators like, et cetera. And on every one of those metrics, the James River, was, it was night and day between the other ones. The, the James River has by far the most water withdrawals, has by far uh, the lowest water quality. You just tick down the list. The, uh, the Rappahannock, for example, now that Embry's gone, no dams even remnants on the Rappahannock. So um, the reason the shad have been able to hang on in these other rivers is they're just not being subjected to the barrage of impacts that are, all of them are occurring on the James. Um, that gives me a little bit of hope. These fish can bounce back. You just gotta give them half a chance. I have hope, Chaz. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, Marilyn, um, you asked about the shad planking. Yeah, I, I can't tell you what river they come from, but um, my understanding is that event is not happening now. And I, I don't, uh, you know, my, I presume that it's because of the limited availability. Um, so that, that, that's probably gives some pause too. It's worth uh, kind of 
stopping and thinking about and, and, and reflecting on. This is a, a kind of a famous uh, political festival in Virginia, the Shad Plinking Festival, no longer happening. Um, they've kind of shut down, and um, um, there's not there's not shad um, in the James River. There's not shad available for this to continue. Um, and the the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission has said on the whole um, that shad are hurting up and down the Atlantic coast. Um, but what we're really here to talk about tonight is that there are these unique factors that we've um, identified in the James. Um, there are some some things that are particularly challenged that challenging that we're going to have to address um, to um, to really get shad bouncing back. Um, Robert, the the no data um, or the years where there it looked like zero that was those were no data years. So the data was not collected in those years. And let's see any other questions that we haven't gotten to yet. Folks, yeah, if you think of any more questions. I, I, I put them in the, chat, in the chat box, but put have sent them to Alan by mistake. I had a question for Professor Cowan. Are there any comparative analyses showing changes in water withdrawals benefiting shad and other rivers? Uh, I am not aware of that. I, well, more specifically, I have not looked for that, but but I'm not aware of that. that to the extent that we have comparisons, we, we did quantify all water withdrawals on the Rappahannock and the Potomac, and they're just much, much lower on those those other rivers. Okay. Uh, what 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 we really need to answer that question is, is more data from those two power plants. They are as part of their relicensing. They they are doing some sampling. Uh, a, a lot more data need to be collected to document exactly how many fish they're impinging and in training. Those data are relatively difficult to get. It, you would think, well, we're, you know, we got a power plan and we'll just stick some nets down, but to get getting reliable data is, is really difficult. Uh, but, but to really document how much damage those plants are doing, uh, it, they need to be sampled directly. And Jamie, if I can ask another, is that okay? Yes. Yeah, please do, Jason. And thank you all. Great presentations. I meant to say that at the top. Uh, I really appreciate you focusing on this. And um, to that point, um, I know you're focusing on it more. I still feel like the response to this, you know, sort of a slow, tragic decline of the shad is a little bit muted by the state and NGOs. And I'm wondering why there isn't a commission or task force uh, statewide or, you know, range wide, if you will one of the both, um, focused on this in a more urgent and significant way. It's a great point, Jason. I'm just going to echo the, that it's an urgent need. And it's it's hard to, to stress that enough. Um, in our last day of the James, we also issued this, this um, concern that we needed more of a united front, a, a plan going forward. Um, and we've, we've been in a phase of the last two years where there have been experts meeting and, and talking about these issues, but we just haven't gotten um, you know, any renewed efforts underway yet. So for our part, we, we agree and think that this is an extremely important priority. Um, it may be the only zero we've ever had in our state of the James report that, I, that I'm aware of, and that's not something to be proud of. We wanna do all we can to change that. So I, I, I'll tell you, um, I've spent a lot of time talking to agency staff um, all year, but especially in the last few weeks as we prepare for this release. And we're going to definitely be pursuing some resources from the state to, to have um, the experts come together, not just to talk about the issue, but to recommend some specific changes. Uh, there's certainly more we can talk about on catfish and, um, and some of these other stressors that we just didn't have time to get to tonight. You know, the state is doing some things, some experimental things with um, electroshock fishery, trying to harvest as many um, invasive catfish as they can, um, um, but also trying to balance the interests of other folks who, who want to have a trophy fishery and, and maintain that for the James. So, you know, there's a lot of interests um, involved here, but I think there's a lot of work that's still happening in the background that needs to be more in the spotlight that just maybe a lot of folks aren't aware of. I'd just like to follow up with that. Why, you know, why no 
uh, big action being taken right now. Uh, back in when the uh, Bosher's Dam fishway was being built, when the dams were being breached, when the hatcheries were planting millions of fry up into the James River, there was a real spirit of optimism that we were doing the right things to get to a solution. And so uh, people felt good about things that Shad were still not coming back, but there was a, a great plan in place to restore them. And it really wasn't until 2017, 2018, when it was clear that it failed and the stocking stopped. And if you look at those graphs, when the stocking stopped, the fish collapsed. That, that stocking program for that 10 or 15 years, whatever it was, that was what was sustaining shad in the James River. So now that it's obvious that that fantastic plan did not work, Now's the time to get energized to fix it. And I'm really glad that the JRA is doing events like this one to make people aware of how dire the situation is. And we hope then some substantive action can really be taken. Yeah, uh, Jason, um, if, I, if I may, uh, Jamie. Uh, yeah, that, that's a, 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 appreciate those comments, Chaz, because uh, you know, if you go back to the very beginning of this whole thing, you know, it was, everything was on the table, you know, uh, harvest moratorium, stocking, providing fish passage. And, you know, each one of those things, you know, had a positive effect to some extent. I mean, obviously, you know, we're sitting here talking about this now in 2021 because it didn't have enough of a positive effect. And, you know, these other perturbations and problems that, that have been discussed, uh, you know, it's, it's um, those all, all those things are still very alarming. And, you know, so we, so we do have, you know, we have the Virginia Losa Task Force, we have a Virginia Stream Barriers Task Force, you've got the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission that, you know, continues to, you know, they just did an, another shad stock assessment. So, you know, it's being addressed, it's being looked at, you know, and I think, uh, you know, our problem we're faced with now is we need to, you know, to have a recovery plan, we need to know what to do. And, you know, like Chaz said, we thought we had those answers. Uh, all those things were the right things to do at the time, uh, especially, you know, controlling harvest and providing passage, because we ultimately want these fish to survive on their own. But with so many other problems continuing, you know, it's, I, I have some glimmer of hope at this point in time. Um, but, you know, I, I, I need, a, I need some positive things to happen to, to, to have some real hope, I guess is, is what I would say. Well, I appreciate that, Alan. And one thing I've learned in recent years is it's, it's really going to take efforts from a lot of individuals, a lot of agencies, a lot of organizations. Um, you've carried this flag certainly for many years, but you can't do it alone. And um, so we, we, we're committed to, to, to being a big part of this as we go forward. Um, I, we're over at time, folks, so I want to start to, to wrap it up. Um, Warren, I haven't given you a chance to, to offer any final remarks. Anything you want to say as we wrap up before I um, sign us off? Any salient points you want to, you want to share about um, Chad and your experiences? Um, yeah, you know, I... I I think that it's going to be a pretty hopeful um, project to restoring the shad population. It's already actually been ruled in the state in the Virginia Supreme Court that the state actually has an obligation to keep a healthy shad stock in the rivers for the Virginia tribes. Um, and I think that's something that can be used to uh, really push this fur further. Um, so, you know, I'm personally excited to see uh, more actions come from this and, um, working with you know, different organizations to bring the shad population back up to healthy numbers. Well, I'm excited to, to, to be here with y'all. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just wrap it up by saying something that we, we occasionally throw out at JRA, uh, fish grow on trees. So I thought this would be a, a good final slide. Um, 
as we go into the fall too. Um, we're, we're planting a lot of trees. We're doing a lot of work to um, protect the, the, those, um, those riparian corridors, those forested areas along the river. So we hope you all learned something. We hope you enjoyed the presentation. We hope you'll go out and plant a tree. You can do that with us if you want to sign up on our website and uh, volunteer to be a part of our riparian forest restoration program. Um, but please um, uh, follow, follow us, check us out, look at our information on our website. We will follow up with everybody by email and give you some links for things that you can do. Um, please go to the, the Pamunkey website and to the Randolph Megan website and see what they're doing as well. Um, but with that, I want to thank you all for being here. Um, we will sign it off. Thank you to the presenters. Thank you for the great questions, and I hope you have a great evening. <laughs>